webinar, Reopening Medical Practices and Creating Your New Normal. Today's webinar is hosted by Stroudwater Associates Principal Opal Greenway. As an accomplished healthcare and finance professional who focuses primarily on the strategic needs of healthcare service providers, Opal is the practice leader for the Provider Operations and Strategy Group. She is an expert in physician practices, compensation, surgery centers, physician hospital alignment strategies, and regulatory compliance. As a reminder, there will be time for Q&A. Please use the chat function to ask your, your questions. Finally, the slides and presentation will be available after the webinar and will be an email to everyone. And with that, I will hand it over to Opal. Thank you, Ashley. Um, and thank you everyone for attending this webinar today and sharing with those who are not able to uh, join us today. Today, we are going to be talking about reopening of medical practices. We have been in shutdown mode for a significant amount of time um, with many of us seeing very few patients or doing so remotely or having been completely shut down. The reality is healthcare services are needed um, beyond just COVID related services and so practices are going to have to reopen. The way in which we go about reopening is going to determine our success from not just from an individual practice perspective or from a hospital, but for communities overall and being able to maintain their access to healthcare. However, reopening up your practice is not as simple as going and unlocking the doors on Monday and going to proceed with things at business as usual. We are in a state of new normal. We have to determine whether or not when is the exact time, right time for us to reopen, what operational changes we need to be made, and we re realistically, we have to consider the financial implications of reopening and how long are we able to do such sustainably. Being a optimist overall, uh, I like to look at things of what are the opportunities that this creates for us. And that when we're defining our new normal, can we use this as an opportunity to create a sustainable healthcare environment in the physician practice space and be able to provide great care to our patients that are much needed and allow us to continue towards a value-based and a population health model that oftentimes in working with several practices the sheer volume and needs of our sick care patients have caused us to not be able to do. Does this allow us to put into place certain best practices, be creative and decide what, how would we like to see patients in the future um, and what does our community really need? So taking advantage of those opportunities and pursuing them with a, um, with a significant level of vigor. So let's start off with talking about the decision to reopen. Uh, this was pulled yesterday. We were at one, just under 1.2 million cases. I checked today from the CDC. We are over 1.26 million cases of COVID here in the United States. Our death toll is up over 74,000 of, as of this morning. Um, the numbers will continue to increase, and there's been plenty of people forecasting of when we will cross that 100,000 um, death threshold. However, there's, a, there's always a trade-off by focusing entirely on COVID and not being able to focus on the other care that patients have needed. It was on April 19th that CMS issued their first recommendations for reopening facilities to provide non-emergent, non-COVID-related health care. This is health care that we still need while we are going to continue to um, tackle the COVID pandemic realistically we need those guidelines on how to reopen. However, those guidelines are not exhaustive. It is not a step-by-step -step checklist of every single thing you need to do for your individual practice, for your hospital, um, of all the practices that your hospital may open. So what we're going to do in this webinar is talk about, based off of those guidelines, other things that has come up, best practices, what do we need to do? Because as we've all seen, COVID has had a significant impact on physician practices. If we look at just um, the, where the baseline was in March, we have had every single region across the country has had at least a 40% decline in ambulatory visits for these physician practices. And if you're in the New England or Mid-Atlantic region, you have had almost a 70% decline in your visits since the country shut down in March. There was an article in the New York Times yesterday that I was discussing what it's been like for these, all these doctors with these waiting rooms that don't have patients. Um, there's, a, there's a real concern that certain specialties and certain practices will not be able to reopen, that the economic impact uh, to these practices is that they just will not be able to reopen. 
a lot of people have focused on all the funds that have been coming from the government to help those practices. It has definitely helped several. I have worked with individual practices in filling out their PPP loans and being able to get the, those monies in place. However, the reality is some specialties have been hit harder than others. Those, that 30 initial $30 billion in funds for practices and hospitals, those relief payments were based off of previous year's Medicare. So what does that do for practices such as pediatrics and OBGYN that don't have Medicare payments? They haven't been receiving the same funds that others have, but that doesn't mean, what does that mean pediatrics as a specialty as we know it of go, taking your child to the physician's office will cease to exist? Uh, that is a significant risk and something we need to take in consideration. Same with OBGYN. While almost most OBGYN practices that I work with have stayed open to a certain extent because babies didn't get stopped being born during this time, um, they've done it so at a very limited capacity and having to operate with staff without having the same revenue coming in the door. On top of that, some of the practices that are looking to reopen have been converting a lot of their visits to telehealth and realizing that while they can't have the same throughput doing telehealth visits, they tend to take longer than an in-person visit as you're having the patient self-assess certain things and give feedback to the physician to be able to make appropriate diagnoses and tell them whether or not they need a physical examination. That um, the payments for telehealth visits being on par right now with in-person visits is not going to be sustainable and it's not going to continue forever. So doctors, while they've been, everybody has been very responsive to COVID and adjusting, it doesn't necessarily mean we can reopen these practices. So in thinking about first, if you can reopen, think about can you reopen? Legally, can you reopen? What is going on in your state? While those healthcare facilities have been considered essential facilities regardless of lockdown, different states have had different requirements for whether or not you can open even as an essential facility what are the specific requirements that will allow you to reopen is it the full gamut of services that you have historically provided is it some sort of reduced services that you are allowed to provide um, the american medical association has issued an overview for every single state's current regulations including the states that have decided to reopen and where they are for those practices so I encourage you to look at what your state specifically is doing. However, just because your state has its own requirements, there are also specific county and municipality regulations as well. I currently live in Franklin, Tennessee, just out of, south of Nashville, and Williams, which happens to be in Williamson County. Williamson County is following the state regulations for the partial reopen of Tennessee but Davidson County, where Nashville is located, has not. On top of that, we have specific regulations for Brentwood and Franklin that actually cross over the different counties. So you can imagine the confusion for those of us who do, are not opening up a facility to knowing what we're allowed to go to and what we're not. If you have facilities as a hospital or as a physician practice in multiple counties, you need to understand, or in multiple municipalities, what are the requirements for each one of your locations. Each location needs to be looked at independently. But then you also have to consider where is your patient draw? Where are they coming from? They might be under a different perception than what your physical geographic location is. So knowing that you're going to have to actually do education for your patients to understand the differences of what the different lockdown orders that exist and reopening requirements are. Then there's the question of should you reopen? Can, and the biggest thing about should you reopen is balancing the need between the fact that we have patients who have had delayed elective care for the past 60 days or more, and also the fact that you have to have safety for your staff and those patients. Can you provide, if you reopen, can you provide your care in a safe manner that reduce, that has a the most um, risk avoidance manner for being able to provide that care while balancing with the fact that these patients do need care. The longer certain patients go without care, it no longer becomes elective and they end up in the emergency department. So take those into consideration in this making the decision should you reopen. We'll talk about also the financial decision after we talk about what does it mean operationally if you are going to reopen. Keep in mind, just because we have all of these visits that haven't been happening over the past couple of months, that does not mean that there is going to be a flood of patients going to our doors the day that we open them. That being open does not mean you are going to be busy. 
right? You need to sit down and make some volume assumptions. I start out by looking at what are the number of unseen appointments during the shutdown by going back through. And as we did a webinar actually back in March with regards to you to, um, how do you best utilize and leverage your practices during that, we advise people to make sure that they're tracking on a weekly basis at the very minimum of which patients are not being seen so that they can understand from a care management standpoint for those chronic care um, patients and those who determining whether or not some, something was elective or urgent and needed to be seen during the shutdown and how that was going to be done. Take those numbers to see, come up with what is your true number of unseen appointments. Know that some of these appointments aren't going to be needed anymore. Whether that is they sought care elsewhere, they ended up in the emergency department, but also think about the continuum of care, right? What are all the different pieces of it? Is a certain appointment that was a follow-up for labs no longer relevant because the labs that were done previously are now outdated? And so while this appointment may be needed, you need to have different labs done first. So understand what are the different factors that are going to impact that. Um, the Commonwealth Fund issued uh, a recent study at the end of April that showed that 71% of visits that were can um, amongst the age group of those school aged those visits, 71% of those were canceled. In thinking about that, you think about school aged children across the country are now being homeschooled. You now have parents who are working from home as well as homeschooling their children and their ability to bring a child into the clinic unless that child is particularly sick, in which case they might be going to the emergency room instead, they might not be doing their annual visits with those children anymore because they can't actually keep in tow other children while working from home and doing homeschooling. So it just may not be feasible for them anymore. Once you come up with a total volume, an adjusted volume number of patients that you know need to be seen that were had foregone care or did not get care in the past couple of months, you need to prioritize these appointments based on that patient need. Go through your clinical protocols. There's been several for each specialty. I've been on several of their different websites. They have your list of how you can actually triage each kinds of patient and putting them into the different categories. I, you know, whether you color code your categories or label them certain things, you're going to have to engage with your staff to understand these categories because it's going to be very important for how you address your scheduling. Keep in mind there's other factors that are going to impact volumes. Patients are afraid right now. Um, you know, and that there are patients right now who are not afraid and are can't wait to get back to their appointments, but they might be afraid of this, particularly going into healthcare systems because they assume that if somebody, if they're going into a physician practice, there are sick people there, and that is what people are avoiding. There's also been a significant hit to our economy. So patients may be afraid of the overall cost of their care. Care that they once could afford, they might not no longer be in a position to afford that care. They don't know what you're, are you going to be able to still have the same kind of payment policies you had previously? What's happening with their insurance? Were they laid off? Could layoffs be coming on in their company um, at some point in the future? So the cost is going to drive some of their decisions. They might have found alternatives and they might continue to find alternatives going forward, whether that be telehealth or the emergency room. There are patients also who are willing to drive further to go to what they might consider a clean facility versus the facility that they went to historically. So it's going to take significant education and efforts on your individual practices part to have the reputation of being a clean facility. And we'll go over those operational changes to making sure that you can be able to demonstrate that. But reputation will be a very driving factor for people. Also, you might be the person, you might have been the alternative. And think about who you may be the alternative for going forward, right? So which patients did you not, have you not seen historically that you may now be their, their location that they go to, right? We have to think about what, um, once we figure out our volumes, we have to think about, all right, how are we going to accommodate these volumes? What is our facility layout? So keep it so that even with places that are reopening, the social distancing requirements still stand in place of the six feet apart. So go through your space and figure out how are you going to maintain that social distancing? Are you going to have to put up different barriers to create like whether or not it's plexiglass or another material between staff and patients? What is the best way? If you have a tighter facility, especially in your waiting room, you might want to use your parking lot to continue. There's been plenty of places that have been doing drive-through care. That, that's a possibility for you, but it could also just be your drive-through waiting room. Um, places that I think about that some people 
probably haven't been considering as much are some things such as the break rooms. You have to keep your staff safe. So if they are typically going into the break room in between patients or to eat their lunch or, you know, in first thing in the morning when they get there, how are you going to maintain social distancing in that space? There's also workstations. If you have set up for team-based care um, in the past, which will help you in a lot of ways going forward, you may have co-located your staff. That probably isn't feasible with how you might have set up your pods at this point to be able to maintain social distancing. So how do you need to rearrange those workstations and how many people can you realistically have together in some sort of nurse's station and maintain that social distance? You may need additional FF&E, right? First thing that comes to mind is waste receptacles. There are new standards for the disposal of PPE. The re and keep in mind, the receptacles themselves should ha um, have to be cleaned individually instead of just being able to take out the, um, the plastic bags. Do you have these in every single room? How, um, what is the frequency of them having them in the weight room or other pl um, places without, with, throughout your facility? Then also keep in mind that there are different waivers that are currently in place, such as providing lab services and parking lots. You need to remain aware of these waivers. None of these waivers were intended to be permanent. They were supposed to coincide with the public health emergency. Another one was that RHCs and FQHCs were issued temporary expansion locations. So if you opened up one of these facilities, you need to be monitoring when this waiver ends, how long is it going to go um, coincide, and have a plan to reconsolidate your services if you opened up one of these temporary locations. With that, then you need to examine your workflows, right? So we, we figured out how much volume we're gonna have, here's the space we're going to be able to see those patients, now how are we going to be able to see them? You have to think about the entire patient workflow. Oftentimes before COVID, when we were doing disaster planning or helping practices with their practice improvement, we always go through these workflow walkthroughs of understanding what, every, what is everything that happens in the patient. Is it everything from pre-visit prep, the check-in process, getting into the room with the patient, handing the patient off to the physician, the, um, what is entailed in the physical examination, the checkout process, and then turning over the room to be able to be available for the next patient. So in that entire workflow, what are all of the steps that are included in that workflow? Now in a new world, and so hopefully you already have that workflow figured out because you've done a workflow walkthrough. If you haven't, this is a great opportunity to examine what your processes are. Now you need to figure out which of these processes is now going to be longer because of COVID, different sanitation requirements, patient education and fear, and, and the potential staff that you have. So how much time is it going to take? Now you think about it from the perspective of so many people insurance has changed for a significant amount of time. There have been plenty of practices I've been in that historically their insurance verification was, has anything of your insurance changed since the last time you came in? And a lot of times they would, they would simply ask, well, have there been any changes? And they only did the verification in January when they're used to people having changes. Now more and more people will have changes in their insurance and it might not just be because of unemployment and furloughing, companies might be changing their insurance carriers at this time, looking for better rates and um, different things that are available to them. So going through and making sure that insurance verification and eligibility is done is going to take longer for every single patient. Patients might have a lot more questions about the financial implications of them being there. And so you might have to spend more time on patient education. Uh, the physical examination, depending on what checklist of the patients may be coming in with a lot more complaints than what they originally scheduled for, and so being able to have more time for that physical examination. Even the state um, of actually rooming the patients, right? There might be additional safety precautions that you have to do. One thing that we've done in the past when we're trying to implement lean systems and reducing the waste is for certain types of visits, you always had the exact same type of equipment out in that room, regardless of whether or not you needed this was the standard amount of equipment. Well, now you might need to have do, do different sterilization of that equipment every single time. So now does that previous process that you put in place to reduce waste by having these equipment trays for the visit ready now actually create waste because you have to re-sterilize? So maybe you shouldn't have those out in the room the way you did previously all ready to go. So examining things from that perspective and being create, and also thinking about how can we be creative of making this a visit 
as efficient as possible. So removing what opportunities do we have to remove other things that create waste in our time to come up with what is the actual minutes per visit or minutes per encounter that hopefully you've been tracking previously, what is that new norm? And then keeping in mind, what do you have to do after the visit? And not just in that specific room, but anywhere else throughout, throughout the process before the next patient comes in. So then once you've gone through and examined what your workflow is, and you need to engage your staff to do this. This is not something that as a practice administrator, I can sit at my desk at home and kind of draw out. You want to make sure your staff are involved in this process, which means probably going, like bringing them as a in certain teams to the office and doing these walkthroughs, getting their input of who can, who could be doing things a little bit better, right? How, how are we going to be able to address this? What are their concerns? What are the kinds of things that they, they might be nervous about performing? And create a checklist for every single process. I know that seems tedious. There's a reason why the heavily regulated industries such as the airlines that they have these checklists. Having those checklists, being able to modify it as accordingly as things change, waivers are removed, you know, we get to a new normal, things become steady state is going to be important. But then it's also, if something goes wrong, your checklist help you identify where did it go wrong and allow you to be able to make those adjustments. So having that checklist is absolutely crucial for every single process, as tedious as that may sound. So now that we know, okay, we have how many patients, where they're going to be seen, how they're going to be seen. Now we need to talk about who's going to see them, right? How many staff do you have? Did you lay off people? Did you do furloughs? Have they been, have they been reassigned elsewhere because of needs in the hospital potentially? So how many staff do you actually have available? Keep in mind, some of your staff may not be coming back. They, may, they might have chosen that they do no longer either want to work in this field, they don't want to work at an individual practice, they might have been able to go on to unemployment and have access to, uh, you know, other things. It might not be financially feasible to them because another family member has been furloughed. So you really, you're going to have to have a conversation with each one of your staff to determine truly how many do you actually have available. One of the things that um, in talking to others we think will work well is actually a rotating team model. If you have done team-based care, this will be very familiar to you, where you have an actual team working together of physician A, nurse A, medical assistant A, front desk person A, but they work together as a team. That team always is together, and then you have all of your people grouped into separate teams, as opposed to one of the ways that has been done for certain practices is to share personnel. Right. The problem with shared personnel as opposed to having rotating teams is say medical assistant that is um, that works with three different physicians comes down sick. If that person comes down sick, determining who is safe to continue working is a much larger task than if you consolidate people into teams. If you have at these, if you use this team model, you can rotate these people through days or shifts as appropriate. So I put in the example here of week one, team A works three days and team B works two. Whether or not you alternate that Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or it's three days on, two days off, it may be make more sense for you to do it as shifts of here's the morning crew and here's the afternoon crew. But you allow to have that um, ability to isolate if you do have exposure and have a plan but you can also ensure continuity between those teams and it actually makes for for those of you who have experience with team-based care it does make um, for something that's very beneficial for the patient care going forward because they get to really know the patients that are on that that team deals with also keep in mind how you're going to deal with staff absences and have plans for alternative coverage the cdc has issued guidelines um, that you'll be able to click on the link uh, to go to those different guidelines with regards to mitigating against those staff absences during COVID. But in our previous presentation that we did in March, you should be planning for up to, for at least 40% absenteeism during this time. It is not just your staff who will get sick. They may have family members that get sick that half they might be out for. Um, I have to say, unexpectedly, us in Nashville, we had both a tornado and then this whole past week, we have had other storms that have caused people to be out that had nothing to do with COVID. So keep in mind, it's not just a matter of, well, here's how many, here's the ratio of the population that has been out sick because of COVID. It'll be additional reasons as well. So 40% absenteeism is the baseline for planning at this time. 
then there's other staffing things that you have to take into consideration, right? You do have staff that might be at risk, whether because of underlying conditions or because of age or both. Now, what, how you utilize those staff, you have to, there is under, under employment law, you have to make reasonable accommodations for your staff to continue. You can't just say because you're high risk, you can't work here anymore. You're in the group that was furloughed, only healthy people can work here, right? Those, what those accommodations are, there's both federal and state and local laws that have to be, um, that you should be checking into as to what constitutes reasonable accommodations. Do you have to allow that staff to have the opportunity to work from home? Do you even have that work from home option? So if you have, if you're providing telehealth services, is this staff more appropriate for being able to provide those services at home? Or, you know, what are those reasonable accommodations? And again, it varies from, a, from at least from state to state. So you want to contact um, an employment attorney in your state to be able to get guidance as to what are you actually required for those reasonable accommodations, including even though there is um, the CDC criteria for health professionals to return to work if they end up being symptomatic, you need to check what the, um, compare that to the reasonableness accommodations to make sure you're always supposed to be able to provide the greater of, right? So if CDC has issued something, but your local employment law requires you to provide more, you need to go with what's within your, lo uh, your local one. Then it needed to think about when your staff comes in, what are your protocols that you're going to put in place to keep them safe? A lot of places that I have talked to, hospitals are already doing this, is to set up and enforce a daily temperature check policy when the staff immediately shows up to work, right? Whether that's the across the forehead temperature check or going through some of your supplies to be able to have that and making sure you have those policies in place to what happens if the staff come in that ha they may be symptomatic. Refer to that CDC criteria for making sure you have policies for handling both symptomatic and asymptomatic staff if they come up with a COVID-19 positive test. Then also imagine, do you have enough testing in place for your own staff to be able to open your place um, sufficiently? That's going to be access to testing is one of the things that people are most concerned about reopening these facilities because they don't have access to testing. Then also consider your non-patient staff. So these are the staff that could they work remotely? Your billers, your coders, your schedulers. Are these people, yes, while normally it would be more efficient for them to be in the office with you to mitigate any risks of exposure, can they work at home? If they are, you're going to have to be able to provide them with the appropriate equipment to be able to work, whether that's technology equipment, can, um, you know, phone, internet, what are you going to have to be able to put them with? For these staff, make sure you're developing, I would say do this for all staff, but especially for at home, those that you have not typically had different performance measures in place, you're going to need to set those up. If you are paying somebody hourly, how are you going to have them check in to make sure that they're working? Are you, um, one thing I would suggest is to put together, you know, here's your productivity of how many, if you're billing, here's how many charts I expect you to get through in a day from that. Know that they may not be as productive as they were when they were in the office, but you need to have some set of standard to make sure that this resource is still producing at a way that is cost effective for you to have that resource. Okay, set those measurements, figure out what your baseline is going to be. Keep in mind there's some staff that you might not historically have thought of needing, but might be appropriate now, such as financial advisors, right? Patients are going to need the education about your financial payment policies. Some of them, because it now may be eligible for Medicaid, and so this patient, you want to see them and they will be better off um, instead of being in self-pay, being under Medicaid, but they need somebody to help guide them to how can they get that Medicaid coverage. Or they might be able to be eligible for the expansion of the exchanges right now. So consider, do you need staff to be able to handle that? Then you'll want to create a schedule. So we know how many people, where they're gonna be seen, how they're gonna be seen, by whom, and now we need to figure out with what, with what frequency, okay? This is not going to have something that happens overnight. You need to do some sort of soft opening. Before you even do the soft opening, you need to run through the schedule, through, go and do a dry run, right? These are significant changes from how you've operated historically. So do that soft opening and assume that you need to be going at a lower capacity. It is not the same 24 patients per day per provider that you might have been doing historically. Once you've developed your workflow to understand what is your average time per encounter for the patient for the workflow, think about an additional time that you need to add to that metric. 
Okay, you want to avoid any high volume or high density time period for the patient where you're gonna have a lot of people in the waiting room if you don't have the ability to do a parking lot waiting room. Keep in mind that you also, what happens if patients are late, right? We have backups, we've all been there where we're you know, four patients behind um, because of things taking longer. So put in those different blockers within your schedule to allow catch up for that you're not going to have these large backups in your day. Um, you know, anything from lab work is missing. Go through and work with your team to understand what are all the different variables that are going to cause us to have bottlenecks and make sure you have a plan for those. Right? You want to create a written scheduling policy so that those who are doing the front desk and doing that scheduling, that they know exactly how to prioritize the patient needs based on the type of patient. You don't want the delay of having front desk having to ask for every single patient that calls in where should they go into the schedule? You need to make sure your front desk is well educated in that. Make sure that they have scripts. I know some people initially when I come in and do process improvement with them, they hate scripts. They feel say it feels completely unnatural. Here's a place where scripts are absolutely necessary. You need to set these protocols. You need to be able to have your front desk have be able to read from a script that a physician has been able to check the box and uh, said this is the appropriate script to do care advice messaging, right? Whether or not you can assess that person, the front desk person can advise that patient whether or not they can be need to make an appointment or could they be seen virtually. Right? There's also different pieces that you need want to make sure you have a script um, on what the patient's supposed to do when they come here. You don't want the patient having had for the first time what they're supposed to do when they see a sign on the door if they were supposed to wait in their car. That front desk person, whoever is doing the scheduling, who is ever is doing your patient appointment reminders, needs to go over the entire protocol with these patients and have a script for that. So those are just some of the operational changes that you're going to have to be able to do. And know that they're significant and they can't be done overnight and they can't be done alone. You have to work with your staff and being able to set these in place. And I have to say, a lot of times staff come up with some of the great ideas for the process improvement of how can we run this better. But you also have to consider, is it financially feasible for me to reopen my practice for um, or all of our different locations, if that, that's the case? So you want to come up with a revised budget. You had your budget for the year. You had your baseline numbers. You had your historical of what was normal. Okay, hopefully you have some baseline measurements that you can be able to adjust, such as, okay, here's how much we had in value-based care revenue. Here was our personal pay collection rate. Here's our net insurance collection rate. Here's how many work RVUs per encounter we have. Here's how many encounters we have per provider FTE. So starting out with your baseline financial measures, right, and adjusting those based off of what your new anticipated volume is. Then keep in mind, how do those metrics that you have historically, do they need to be adjusted for what's going forward? Your payer mix is going to change, right? Patients, is, most practices know that patient responsibility is oftentimes the hardest thing to collect um, anyway. And the fact that the amount of patient responsibility has gone up significantly with the changes of people's current insurance statuses, that's going to need you to make sure you adjust your bad debt assumptions and how many days you have in your AR. Your, sorry, your accounts receivable on your on your new budget. Okay, keep in mind what are you going to be. You might want to adjust what your self pay fee schedule is based off of knowing how many people you're going to have in self pay. Then take those and go ahead and do your revenue projections for all of your services. If you have been one of those that has been providing telehealth and has that paid on parity, as I said previously, Telehealth is likely to continue. That is one thing that is going to come out of this COVID uh, pandemic is we are going to continue to have telehealth services. The public has very um, largely embraced it in a way that people thought um, were skeptical of before the pandemic, that people wouldn't just wouldn't want to use technology. Physicians wouldn't want to use technology. It has been embraced through this pandemic. It's not going anywhere. But it isn't going to be paid at 100% of an in-person visit. So right now, the guidance that we're seeing, um, seeing from just talking to different payers is that the maximum amount that people have um, anticipated that telehealth will continue to get paid for would be at about 85%. One, Medicare will do one thing, we'll see what the commercial payers do, so you'll wanna keep an eye on that. Make sure you can adjust your bu budget accordingly when you, as these things come out. Then keep in mind you are still gonna have changes in um, expenses, right? Bringing back any furloughed employees that you might have had, um, let go or sorry, furloughed previously, having that conversation out with them. 
you need to model out the time frame for bringing these staff back based off of how you are able to process these volumes in a safe, uh, safe place. Keep in mind that the expense associated with bringing back for load employees, some employees are who have been getting the stimulus check of, um, for unemployment where they get an additional $600 per week. You need to make sure you talk to your employees who some of them, I, and I've had some of these conversations with especially like MAs and such, who say, I make more on unemployment, why would I come back? Like, you know, I'll come back after July 25th. Well, you need to know what, I mean, will you still be open on July 25th if you don't, if your employees don't come back? Make sure you educate the staff about their options. We don't project foresee anybody coming back. You need to match what I make in unemployment. It's more about educating the, the employee about the additional costs if they go past, if, okay, if they're going, if they make more on unemployment instead of being furloughed, they'll be laid off. Now they'll be responsible for their own health insurance or other expenses. And that $600 a week that ends on July 25th isn't going to go as far as they thought it was going to go. So have those conversations with your employees. On top of that, what are going to be the changes on your expenses for supplies? You're going to need additional PPE, right? You you might have a reduced drugs expense because of the volumes aren't going to be there. You you know, you might have ordered a whole bunch of flu vaccines back earlier in the year that then you, those patients didn't come in and you didn't administer flu vaccines the way that you were expecting to in February and March. Consider what are the critical supplies. If you can afford to stock, on that, stock up on those that you're going to be going through very quickly, normally physician practices will have two week supplies on hand, um, up to two to four weeks, depending on the type of supply. Consider can you get your hands on that much? If you can, do you have room to stockpile some of them? Do you still need the same amount? You want to um, avoid as many disruptions during the day for deliveries as possible. So work with your vendors on that. A lot of vendor contracts that I've worked with have minimum order requirements. So keep in mind, you may need to change vendors or have conversations with your vendor vendors, and they may be changing how much it costs if you can't meet minimum order requirements. So make sure you also have backup vendors in place and calculate the expense associated with that. Regarding technology, this may have increased for telehealth purposes or being able to have um, employees work from home. So make sure you have the any expenses associated with that. While there have been waivers for medical mal malpractice under the PREP Act, those medical malpractice waivers are for those treating COVID and so in COVID-related tasks. So if your practice when you come back online is not directly treating COVID related um, issues, you may want to have a conversation with your malpractice provider and see what they might be doing to your current rates because there's a lot of um, malpractice in places because of those waivers associated for COVID might be having changes in their premiums from the conversations we're having. And another expense that might be surprising for some of you is that you might have to have certain upgrade expenses. Patients need to feel safe about coming into the practice. And there was um, just healthcare issued a survey recently and where patients want to feel that their practice is hyper clean in order for them to feel that it is safe. That uh, somewhat surprisingly for me when I first heard this, but that sometimes what patients associate with hyper clean may be a, a fresh coat of paint. If the place looks old and run down, they assume it's not clean. Um, I hadn't really thought of that before, but apparently in certain surveys, they are that is what patients are expressing. It might be instead of doing upgrade expenses, you might want to put that money towards advertising and marketing to educate your patients. There's practices out there that are asking, how can we claim that we're like COVID free? Is that something we can advertise? There's not a set standard for whether or not you can claim yourself as COVID free, but you do need to know that at least do the advertising to let the public know you're open, what services you're going to provide. Keep in mind that cash is still king. You need to have a cash flow projection, at least on a weekly basis, that you are updating based on your revised budget, knowing which expenses are cash expenses, which ones are not, what is the revenue in the door, right? What are things, uh, any deferments that you might have made? If you deferred rent, when is that going to be due? How much of it is going to be due? What is the payment program that you have been able to put in place for your vendors, your any lines of credit? So make sure in your cash flow projections you put that in. If you are going to end up having a balloon payment because you've tapped into a line of credit and it's going to come at the end of the year, will you have enough cash to make that given all the changes that you just did to your, your budget based off of the changes in your payer mix? So keep in mind being able to stay open for the next six months 
but then be having to close between a balloon payment, you need to assess that in making your decision about how you're going to go about reopening. Think about other payments you might have received from either commercial payers for Medicare, if you've got an SBA funded payment protection, uh, paycheck protection program, think about what you have to pay back and when is it due and consider you might need to go ahead and stockpile cash that you receive, received for other purposes. If you got a PPP loan, you know, a lot of that would be forgivable if you kept staff, but if keeping staff on and employed for that eight week period under that PPP loan and then you're all out and can't make your other payments, does it make more sense to use those funds to reopen at a reduced amount, have part of that loan be forgivable, the other part of it not be forgivable, but you have a longer time to pay it back at a low interest rate and be able to stay open until you can actually start getting cash in the door. Because keep in mind that any um, accounts receivable has probably come in, in the door during the time that you were closed. So now reopening, it's almost like starting a new brand new practice where you're going to have a delay in any sort of receiving cash related to any services you provide over the next 90 days. Regardless, make sure you put all the measurements in place on your cash flow statement to be, and also on your um, billing statement to be able to track your repayment. Make sure that both the forgivable and unforgivable portions are tracked separately so that you know when anything is coming due. With the patient payments, as we talked about from on the operational side, insurance verification is absolutely a must. You need to consider what your patient payment plans are going to be for patients who have had a change. If you, um, one thing is to look at what your local unemployment rates are to understand what are those changes going to be on your payer mix. You might want to reach out to major employers that if you know that you have, if you're in a community where there's two or three major employers, have they changed who their insurance provider is? that you can understand how is that going to impact your fee schedule and what your um, what is your average revenue per that commercial payer. So then I'll think about those payment plans for your patients, right? One thing is, have you been enforcing your current policy? A lot of practices I've talked to said, this is not the time to be sending patients bills. We have to have a set period. And they went ahead and advertised that so that they could make sure that their patients were receiving care. But if you do that, you need to have that communication and also a plan as to when are you going to resume your, for, your former policy, right, of collecting on payments, whether it's co-pays or collecting balances due. When is that, how long can you financially go with helping patients and what kind of payment plan do you need to have for patients as a result of that, right? With that, think about what kind of documentation. You're going to have more people coming in who are self-employed and unemployed than ever before. Oftentimes, in setting up these payment plans and thinking about what that looks like, people forget about the different documentation that goes with that. And they think about, okay, somebody's under a financial hardship, let's, let's set it out over this amount. Do you need to make sure that you have things for verifying that? Keep in mind, if you're part of a health system, you probably have a corporate policy. That corporate policy may have changed in the past 60 days. So make sure you're working with overall senior leadership, whether it's with the hospital, the health system, or if you're an independent practice, figuring out what, you know, what entails this patient payment plan for all different services. Does it vary based off of the type of location that they're receiving that care? Um, I'm going to touch briefly on other revenue cycle changes. We've been doing actually several webinars um, specific to the different changes in revenue cycles. So please check out our website or um, contact one of our experts, John Bain or Lori Daigle, for any specific questions about the revenue cycle. But when it comes to the physician practices, keep in mind, especially if you do your own billing and coding, um, either at the practice or the hospital does it for the practice, you're not using a third party biller, that while the payers probably have not changed their policies with regards to what do they approve and what do they not approve, there's a lot of things that have, they have auto adjudicators, right, where there's the computerized claims processing, and those have not been able to keep up. We've had so many changes as a result of COVID. I mean, things changing sometimes come multiple times a week that they're not able to come back. To, um, they're not able to keep up. So as a result, more and more things are getting denied that then were previously because they're not keeping up with those changes. So make sure you know that how to review your denials and work with payers to make sure that they're properly researched and getting the appropriate approvals that you're going to. That is means that you're going to have to have significant education for your billers, right, so that they understand what edits need to be made, if there needs to be modifiers, 
specifically for COVID services or for telehealth, make sure they're well aware of each of these. We are doing training for people on these um, specifically right now. So if they need help with that, please let us know. Um, make sure you're determining who is a, who is responsible for appending the modifiers and the condition recodes and how they're being evaluated who, and also who's doing those regularly audits on them. Okay. Um, addition to that, some of these waivers are contingent on patient surges. So if your location or your facility isn't actually what's considered surge, but you're trying to pay attention to the waiver, that waiver may not apply for you. And so if it doesn't apply for you, make sure your billers and coders are well, um, well versed in how to be able to respond to that and what constitutes a surge and so that they know when does it apply versus when does it not. Before we get to questions, I wanna talk a little bit about, you know, we've been talking about the opportunities here of thinking about things that maybe you didn't have in place previously. You might not have ever done an actual workflow walkthrough to identify where are their waste options. You might not have for all of your staff right now, metrics on how you're determining what, um, what services they're providing with what efficiency. You might not have, when we were talking about the financial pieces, do you, have you been tracking net insurance collection rates? Have you been tracking personal pay collection rates? Do you know what your currently what your staff minute per encounter are? You might not have been doing those metrics. Now is the time to set those things in place. We got we have this great pause. Consider it a great reset. Of here's an opportunity to reset our practices and have them now operate the way we would like them to operate within the current guidelines and maximize efficiency so that as things become safer, we can continually adjust. So get the metrics measure them, know what they are going forward, and, and then when as things change, be able to adjust, right? I don't like using benchmarks just to compare it to a survey for the sake of comparing it to a survey. I want to know what your benchmarks are from internally. What are you, trend? how are you trending? What adjustments are you making as a result of monitoring those, right? We don't just track data for the sake of it. Um, Understand what those opportunities are in your workflow to make things. You'll be amazed at how your team starts to, how they've been thinking about things in downtime and thinking about ways to be, you know, to step up. Can they understand, is the right, am I the right person doing this or should somebody else be doing it? What if we did it differently this way? This would be a lot more efficient. You know, hand things off and have other people create the checklist as well so that you can see where their ideas are going. Help them, have them help in creating the schedule. Make sure you create the policies and enforce them. You cannot get the reputation and stay open if you are the practice that is not that is known for seeing improper disposal of PPE. Yes, you might not have medical malpractice associated with that, but reputationally, you can't be the dirty practice, right? You have to be the hyper clean practice. Keep in mind what are the telehealth services you've been providing. Going forward, now that it hopefully it's not as scary as it was previously to expand the telehealth services, are these ones that we can continue to provide? We Now that we're getting reimbursed for them, now that we're familiar, now that our patients are educated about it, how is this an opportunity to actually maximize how we see patients? Not just the number, but can we use these for better care management? Right? Are we no longer needing to spend as much time as we did previously doing prescription refills because now we have a better way of doing it that doesn't require the patient to come in? Then think about the data gathering that you're able to do. What would you like to do? One of the things that made so many people upset when we had meaningful use come out in our EHR and all the different metrics associated with it is a lot of physicians I talked to said, this doesn't help me care for my patient better. So what data could you gather now in the hindsight of COVID that would allow you to provide better care to your patients? What data were you missing historically that would have allowed you during this time to do better chronic care management? Did you, did you have in your system easily set up, pull up all the patients that have asthma? Pull up all of my patients that are over this age so that I can contact them to provide them education about where to go in the hospital if they have these symptoms. With that information at your fingertips, if it wasn't, can it be going forward? How can we do a lot better about our data gathering so it turns into usable information that we can use to better provide care for our patients? Not just what we got from a list from meaningful use, right? Use this as a time to make technology better for you. Then think about your alignment opportunities, okay? As a result of this, there is going to be consolidation. And those who are going to scoop up the practices 
because a lot of hospitals and health systems are going to be completely cash strapped right now, there's a lot of expectation that it's going to be super groups, private equity, and their non-traditional providers that are going to be buying up these practices at a significant discount to prevent them from going into bankruptcy. Is Amazon or Walmart or Google Health going to be buying up the practices in your community because the hospital doesn't have the cash to be able to buy it? So if that's the case, consider who, who might be your partners. But it could still be the hospital. And the hospitals that are cash flow, that might be cash strapped, one thing I highly recommend is consider what are your designation opportunities. It's amazing to me, even if, with large health systems um, that don't fully understand the different opportunities and regulations around rural health care, whether it's a rural health clinic or um, being a provider-based rural health clinic or an FQHC, what are the different opportunities that actually might allow these practices to create a lot of financial capabilities for your system? Um, this is something that we're in our experience, we're seeing is very much, it's just not as well known and people haven't been thinking about the strategy behind how to maximize that financial opportunities for these practices, whether it's being able to access uncapped cost-based reimbursement or potentially 340B opportunities that just maybe the corporate system is just not as familiar with because it doesn't apply to the mothership. But if they own a critical access hospital, there might be opportunities there. Or if you're a critical access hospital, are you maximizing your partnerships with the practices, including independent practices, to tap into some of these opportunities? So take that into consideration. Also think about how does we use this to move us down the spectrum towards better population health and value-based care, right? Practices that have large capitation revenue right now are faring much better than those that are on a fee-for-service basis. And with that being the case, those, those practices are going to be very sought after partners. A lot of people have been coming to us talking about from an ACO perspective of what does this mean for our cost of care, you know, and what adjustments we, we might be making um, going forward and what kind of payments we're going to be able to hit, get next year under the a, our ACO. Instead of thinking about it of, okay, how do we move this, how do we use this as an, a great reset to be able to set ourselves up to how we want to provide that care and if we were going to provide care because we had these two months or longer where fee for service is not helping us stay solvent, how can we make the shift to something else? Um, and with that, the other alignment opportunity to make sure is as you're doing this plan for reopen, involve all of your partners, whether you own them or not, your ancillary partners. You know, if, if I've been talking to some surgery centers, helping them figure out exactly how they're going to reopen, how they're going to be able to maximize all these surge elective cases that they need to be able to get through and how should we adjust our scheduling for that. One of the big factors is what are we doing to collaborate with the rehab centers and making sure, okay, if a patient gets a new knee, will they be able to do the proper rehab? If we don't own the rehab, we, you know, what is our partner ready to reopen? If they're not, maybe we, we're not, that patient's not ready to have that surgery because there's no point in doing the surgery if you can't do the rehab after. So make sure you involve them in your in your planning. Keep in mind your ramp up impacts theirs. If they can't provide, if they're not ready to reopen and they can't do it, then your patient care might be, may not help your patient as much as you thought. So with that, I wanted to make sure we left plenty of time for questions. And so thank you everyone for listening in on this presentation today. And I'll turn it over to see what questions we have. Oh, well, we've not had any yet, but uh, I suspect people may be busily getting their questions typed in now. So please use the question section or the chat section in the GoToMeeting window if you have any questions you want to forward on. And if the questions come up later, by the way, feel free. My contact information is on there. Um, I've been directing people, uh, responding to people directly for especially if they have specific questions for their practice of they want to discuss a per, uh, specific situation, definitely available to uh, have those discussions as well. Well, it seems like a quiet group. Oh, here we go. What do you recommend is the best way to secure temporary staff to fill a short-term need while employees are out on FFCRA? Great, um, that is a great question. So if to be able to get temporary staffing, right, I would go to um, 
first people who have worked at the practice potentially previously who might have retired or have gone to a part-time basis is one of the first places I go to. Um, oftentimes, like I've, I've had somebody who switched, you know, they, they ended up having kids, they not, you know, and they were decided, they moved to working from home. That's where, that is one of the places I like to go to. There's also, I like to go out if you are an independent practice or part of a hospital, go and find out, reach out to the hospital and health systems in your area to see whether or not they have staff that they have on furlough or who might be available because they, you know, they, are not opening up the OR. They haven't resumed um, elective procedures yet and find out what their timeline is for their reopening and see whether or not they have any staff available that they can put you in, in touch with. All right. And we are restarting our PHP services for mental health outpatients. Do you have any links or resources for reopening this type of practice? Um, we do have, okay, I can send out um, in our follow-up email, there is a couple of websites that are that are addressing that. I have to say, with reopening that, that has been one that they have been trying to figure out um, how can they, pro because there was a shortage of providers um, in this space prior to COVID to begin with, so that's something that people have been struggling with and coming up with cre um, creative ways, but um, send me a personal message and I'll make sure you have the, the links that I'm thinking of associated with that reopening. And you mentioned courses of instruction for billing and coding staff that is specific to COVID. Will you be posting these? Yes, we do have those. Um, Stroudwater.com, we do have a COVID resource page that has a link to all of the articles that we have written, including webinars, and it is sorted by category. So you can see the ones that are directly re, um, related to revenue cycle and they should all, there's one that's specifically on telehealth billing, then there's ones about um, co, you know changes to billing for COVID and um, modifiers, et cetera. So those are all listed on our website um, on that resources page. And I think that covers most of it. Thank you very much. All right, thank you everyone. And again, if you have any other specific questions you think of, please feel free to reach out and um, stay safe.